Okay. So, I thought I would start off by just telling just a tiny bit about myself. So, I decided to take this picture of my wife and me dancing uh, uh, a couple of days ago. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, this is kind of a reminder for me to remember to say I work for a company called Tango. It's an enormous, enormous com company. It has uh, two employees, my wife and me. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, this is also for me to kind of say that uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, I'm coming maybe from a little bit different background than a lot of folks. Uh, so for the past 14 years, I've been an independent contractor consultant and uh, traveled around North America primarily, uh, working with, well, the last five or six years, I've been working almost exclusively in the area of continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So most of the companies that I work with we deploy our software to production every hour, every hour and a half or so. So it kind of creates a very different focus on um, what quality is and how you approach achieving quality. And so maybe I want to talk a little bit about that later on. And so, but first of all, um, I have a little confession to make. So um, I think I can trust you guys, right? You guys won't, won't share this with anybody? So it's, it's all good? <laughs> Okay, so um, my confession is that I have a, a huge imagination, and it's it's got me in trouble sometimes over my life, but it's also ha part of my creativity, I guess. So, um, and uh, so today I want to share some of the things that have come out of this crazy mind of mine, uh, but I want to start off by talking about how this has affected me in my, my past, and then maybe we could talk about how it will, what I think it's going to help with in the future. I grew up in a very rural area, uh, very, very rural. My, my closest neighbor was about two kilometers away. Uh, I lived in a forest, trees everywhere. And so when I was really young, I spent a lot of time in the forest, just walking around with my imagination. And it was there that I met one of my friends. What, what's that? In touch. Well, <laughs> still in touch a little bit, you know. So, um, so a lot of isolation in the woods, you know, and so in the forest, and so you walk around, and, and your your imagination goes wild. And of course, uh, being a young boy, my imagination. I always imagined that Bigfoot was out there, and that he was. Just, you know, he, he was watching me, and I would hear him sometimes. You know, I'd be in the forest, and I would hear him, and he would be uh, just, just out of sight. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I'd sneak out, and I would yell and make some noises, and I, I swear I could hear him coming back. Uh, those were good times, but eventually I did lose touch with him, I'm sorry to say. Still not in touch. But... My next friend came around um, because Bigfoot wasn't enough anymore, and so I started dreaming about the stars. I started dreaming about traveling the galaxy, and of course, my friends would come and pick me up, and we would cruise around a bit. And um, yes, I, I just had this wild imagination when I was young, but then I, I hit high school age, and that was when I found my true, my true uh, goal in life the thing that was really my, my future. Because I was positive that I was going to be a rock star, you know? Oh yeah. So, enough of that. Um, eventually though, I went away to university and I got a job. And um, a lot of that imagination was sucked right out of me from the corporate world. <laughs> yes, I realized that uh, I had to do some real work, you know, feed myself and, and those sort of things. But uh, it was tough because uh, I would be at work and I would be writing code and, and uh, you know, and I was started off as just a developer and um, I would be writing code and 
I would have people all the time that would come and they look at my code and they say, "Wow, that's 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 very unique. <laughs> that's kind of different." I think it was just my imagination, or maybe it was the influence of, of my earlier friends, Bigfoot and such. So, but it was then that I realized and I learned something really important, which is that we all have different contexts, we all have different ideas, we come from different points in life. So, this brought, brings me to just a few months ago. And, um, I was with some friends, uh, we were at a bar, and um, we were having a, a drink, and one of them said, let's, let's play a game. Let's play a game where we use our imagination. And I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah. I know I've got this one. And the idea was, let's imagine some worlds. Let's imagine some different worlds. Let's imagine, a, uh, and so, I'm gonna ask you to do that with me here, okay? Who has a good imagination here? Anyone? Yeah? Half of you didn't raise your hand, that's sad. <laughs> so we're gonna imagine two worlds, and then we're gonna talk about those worlds and use those to help us figure out what we think the future might be. Because surely it's gonna be one of these. So, the game that I played with my friends is the first game was imagine a world where there's no testers. Imagine a world where nothing is tested, ever, okay? And so I started thinking about this and I started thinking that uh, a lot of things wouldn't work. Imagine an automobile where nothing is tested in it. And so I started imagining this picture of all of these different pieces and parts that are just kind of put together that, that really don't work and you start to drive down the road and, and pieces fall off the car and, and, and next thing you know, it, it stops. I started imagining a world where I walk down the stairs and the stairs fall apart because somebody didn't test it ahead of time. Or I imagine a world where I come in and I plug my laptop in and it doesn't work because we didn't test it ahead of time, which I know we did. So imagine a world where there's no testers. What does that mean? Disaster. What's that? Disaster. It means disaster, doesn't it? So that's one of our worlds that we can think about. But there's another world where everybody's a tester. And I think it's just as disastrous because imagine where every, everybody is a tester and they test everything. And so imagine this world where we start off uh, where he tested the video before he came in, but I don't, I have to test it myself. And so, and everybody has to test everything. Nothing gets done because uh, yes, I know three people have already tested this, but I have to test it myself. And so I started thinking about these two different worlds and the contrast that's between these two worlds. And um, I started thinking, how do these ideas or these concepts apply to the future? What, what can I draw from these two ideas? And so I started thinking, what does our future look like? Is it a future where we have new testers or is it a future where everybody is a tester? Or is it something different? And so, in order to understand the future, a lot of what we have to do is, first of all, think about where we are today. And so I wanted to spend just a little while and talk about my world today, and then I'm gonna take this into the future. So today, um, my world is Agile. Agile Software Development reigns. That's all we do. Um, and a good thing about this is I believe uh, over the last 15 years or so, Agile has gone through some interesting cycles. So it started off as an initiative that was driven by some developers. It was very technically focused. And I think that after a while, it sort of lost that technical edge. And uh, it started to maybe go more around the way to manage work. You know, and that's what Agile became. But I see that changing now a lot. 
I see it going to a point now where it, the focus is back on software development, on the technical aspects. You see that, that is, you've heard of the Agile Manifesto, right? So do you know that Agile in the Agile Manifesto is just an adjective? Agile was just an adjective. It's the manifesto for Agile software development. And the word Agile was put in there because they just didn't want to say this is the manifesto for software development. We don't want to be so pretentious that we say that everyone has to do it this way. And yet I think over a long period of time, we kind of lost that edge that it really is about software development. It really is about uh, building code. It's about working together to deliver a quality product. I'm happy to see that that's come back. Continuous delivery is hot right now. Continuous delivery is, is everybody's talking about CICD. How many of you here are either doing it or at your company you're talking about CICD right now? Look at this. Five years ago, probably almost nobody would have raised their hand. It's just going crazy right now. The amount of, uh, of effort that, that is out there trying to drive toward this continuous delivery. What does continuous delivery allow us to do? What, what's the real big hype? Why are we trying to do it? Is it just because it's fun to uh, deploy software to our users constantly? No, not really. The reason we have continuous delivery is because we want to shift the way we think about products. We want to move toward a world where we don't speculate. Oh, here's what my users want. I'm going to build this thing, and then a few months later they get to see it. But instead, we're going to move to a point where we start with a hypothesis, where we start with an idea. I think I can improve the system by this. And then what do we do? We start to run exam experiments. We, uh, we collect data, and we understand uh, from that, uh, is this hypothesis valid or not? So that's the world today. From a perspective of automation, this is an automation conference, obviously. So what do we have? Well, the world where I live, this is sort of what it looks like. You've all seen some form of a t testing pyramid. Yeah, right? So the world where I live, uh, everybody is writing automation. So the developers are really focused on unit testing, test-driven development, uh, this middle tier of integration tests, which we often forget a lot of. Uh, the testers are building out automation using some BDD style or acceptance test-driven development. There's exploratory testing going on. There's uh, security and capacity type tests. Tons and tons and tons of automation. Again, if you go back five years, 10 years ago, you saw almost none of this. It's amazing. It's amazing what's happening. There are constant, effort, so constant efforts to continue to push the envelope in that space. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a short while. Also, there's lots of other types of testing that we have to be responsible for. Things like accessibility or things like, um, you know, visually inspecting software on different platforms, whatever it might be. Where I work, everybody owns that. In fact, it's a lot of those other things that we, we talk about that really don't require any testing skills whatsoever. For example, if we think about accessibility, uh, you don't have to be a tester to take a um, JAWS. You're, you're familiar with the tool JAWS? It's a screen reader and connect it up to a screen and have it read the screen back to you and say, does that make sense? Does it describe the thing I'm looking at? Uh, to open up a uh, page, and I, an old version of IE, because it always goes crazy in IE, and look to make sure that it looks right, that doesn't require testing skills. Everybody on the team participates in all of those sort of things as well. So, we live in this world that I call a world of no. So, where I work, we have no branches. We can't assume the risk of having source code setting on a branch because merging is risk. Keeping that code not integrated for more than a few minutes is high risk. So we have no branches. We, where I work, we don't allow defects. And that sounds crazy. 
But what that means, it, that means that, that doesn't mean that a defect never happens, but what it means is that as soon as a defect is found, it is the highest priority thing that we have. So those of you who have CI or continuous integration set up, you know that if the build breaks, everybody stops and they swarm and, and get the build going again, right? So that, that's, that's kind of the process. We do the exact same thing with defects. So any time a defect is discovered at all, the team stops and they swarm and they fix it. And so as a result, if you would go talk to the teams and say, how many defects do you have? There's actually only two correct answers that they're allowed to say. Well, that, that they will say. I mean, number one, we don't know of any. Or number two, yeah, we've got the one that we just found that we're fixing right now. And so as a result, we don't have a defect tracking tool. There's no need for one. So there's no need to have a spreadsheet or a tool or something like that to keep track of defects. It's interesting, these, these two things that here, the zero defect policy and no defect tracking tool, do a lot uh, on the, for your mindset. How many of you work at a place where, let's say, you ha think of, don't raise your hand, because you don't want to embarrass yourself or your company, but, <coughs> but you work at a place where there's a lot of, def where you have a lot of defects in your software. <coughs> I see some people raising their hand, <coughs> and I know some of you wanted to, but you didn't, and that's fine. What we found is that having a lot of defects is kind of demoralizing, right? It doesn't feel good if you are working day in and day out with a software and you have a backlog of, of 100 defects because it almost kind of feels like an admission that you know it's, it's, it's kind of acceptable to have a crappy app. I don't want to say crappy, you know, but, uh, but an app that's not of the highest quality. Once you start to put the zero defect policy in place, what starts to happen is we start to think differently about our product. And we start to think about, you know, quality is important. And at the end of the day, I want to feel really good about the software that I'm working on or what it is I'm building. And so people start to take pride. So I have an interesting uh, uh, story. I was working with a team um, in an auto, automobile insurance company. This was probably eight, seven, eight years ago, I guess it was. And it had been months since they had found a defect in their software. And they finally had a defect that was discovered, and it was actually in production. So this defect made it all the way through out to, to uh, their users. And um, it shook the team so bad that the dev lead was literally crying in the team. He, he had tears streaming down his uh, face. And uh, it's kind of an interesting, funny, it's, it's a funny story, but uh, if you think about it, that's a lot of pride. That's about feeling good about your software. <clears throat> no manual deployments. So, all of us have been there where we have manual deployments where, you know, we um, have to go out and copy some things over, tweak some things, and nothing ever goes wrong in that space, right? Never? Never? Um, I've seen lots of companies who also... Uh, automate their deployment everywhere except for their final deployment to production. So in other words, they have some nice process that's going on for everywhere, but then whenever they go to production because it's production, that what they have to do is they have to now document it and they have to hand it off to somebody else who's trusted and they have to go through and often that ends up being pseudo manual deployment. So in other words, what they're doing is they're making the production deployment their riskiest deployment. Let's push all the risk to production. That's a great way to do it, right? <laughs> so, in today's world, though, we really don't have to do that anymore. In fact, what we tend to do is we try to push all the error, all the risk to development. So, if something's going to explode and blow up and, and you know, destroy a city block or what. We want it to be in, in development, right? So. That also means that we don't touch our environments. We don't make changes to anything. So where I work, if I want to make a change to someplace, 
code is written to do that. So let's take like a simple little example of how these last two sort of work together. Um, let's say that I want to make a change to a caching setting or something like that on, on the server, something basic. So what would happen is somebody would actually write code that makes that change. And then they would write a test to make sure that that change actually was applied properly. And that gets checked in. And where does that happen? That happens in development. Again, we're driving the risk there. And so in development, in the first stage of the pipeline, that change gets applied. And the application gets put there. And <coughs> thousands of tests get run against it. And it goes down the pipeline where we see you know, lots of different tests happening, where we see capacity tests, where we see security, where we see, you know, it, it, it's applied across different browsers or different mobile uh, platforms and such. So that by the time that caching change makes it down the pipeline to production, it's a non-event because it's happened on, in many cases, a, a dozen or more environments getting down there and thousands and thousands of tests have been run. And so again, we're driving all of the risk into development. Things like operating system changes, yep, that's where it happens. Again, code is written that does that. So we live in this world of no. <coughs> Excuse me. So why are we doing all of these things? What's the purpose of these? Well, I think that there's three ideas. Um, the first is that this world that I'm talking about, it reduces risk. It drives risk down. Now, that's a crazy thing. Five or six years ago, when I first started doing continuous delivery, continuous deployment, everyone's like, oh my God, that must be the riskiest world you could pop. How can you check code in and it goes straight out to production? That's so high risk. That's crazy. That'll never catch on. But what we learned along the way was that in order to actually do that, in order to achieve that, what do we have to do? We have to drive all of the risk out of the system. So if you think about it, defects in our software, that's risk. Manually making changes to environments, that's risk. There's this thing called drift, right? In other words, we make it to some of the environments, but some don't, and so now no two environments are the same, right? Uh, deployments, that's risk. Branches, that's risk. Uh, not doing thorough testing, that's risk. And so in order to achieve continuous delivery, continuous deployment, we have to drive all of the risk out of the system. So that's one of the reasons we're doing this. The second reason is we want to deliver faster. Do any of you here have your company telling you, hey, we want you to deliver slower, slow down? Slow down. Yeah? No? There's always pressure to get something delivered faster, right? But I think also there's one more reason why we do this. And I think it's because with continuous delivery, it allows us to deliver the right software. So I'll tell you an interesting story, and, and this is very, very recent. Actually, the client that I'm working at right now, uh, so before I got there, they had this uh, change that they wanted to make. A uh, product owner person thought, you know, we, can, we need to improve the way that you navigate through our system. And it's a fairly large site, and they have millions of users that are using this site. And so that's not a small thing. And so he went through the traditional approach, uh, he, first of all, did a very high-level design, got together with some folks and said, let's get an estimate together how much time this is going to take. And um, once he had that, he had to go get budget, right? He had to go beg for money. And um, finally, he got the approval for the money, and then he had to wait for a team to become available. This is probably going to resonate with some of you, right? Right. The team was there, and so now they're ready to start building. So they start writing code, they start delivering it, they're testing it. And I think it, they spent about three or four months or so building this thing out. And as they were getting very close to releasing it, 
their product owner was thinking, you know, what happens if the users don't like this? So let me allow people to opt in or opt out of this change. And so, okay. So there's another month of development and testing together to put this together. And eventually they roll it out. And the way that they rolled it out was really interesting because uh, you, you come in and the first time that you came in after the rollout, this little banner pops up. It says, hey, we've got this new and improved way of navigating. And there was even a little link there that you can click. It would open up a little video and you can kind of see it. You know? and so they, they really did a great job of that. And so users started using this. People started opting in. And I think it rolled up to about 9% or so of the folks started using it. And then it started going down again. And I think it, now this was before I was there, but I think what I heard is that it eventually drifted down to only about 2% of the users were actually using this. And so let's think about that for a moment. How much time and effort and money was spent? A lot of time was spent thinking about this, estimating it, getting the budget approval, Imagine all the documentation that had to be produced. And then the developers and testers and everyone working and building it and getting it ready and finally rolling it out, only to impact 2% of the users. So continuous delivery is really about not doing that. It's about starting with the hypothesis. I think that I can improve the way people move, navigate through my system. And once you start with that hypothesis, then you start to say, what experiments can I run very quickly? What data can I collect to help me know and understand if, I can, if this is the right thing? And you might very quickly start to make some small changes and start to realize that it's not right. So maybe the goal is, is to improve navigation through a workflow. And so we might say, you know, if I make this change, I want to see uh, this improvement in, in uh, flow. In other words, I want to see people be able to get from one point to another in a more rapid uh, fashion. So we'll construct a little experiment, push it out, and say, let's send 20% of our traffic to this new version of the page out there, and let's collect data from both and see. So in other words, let's really try to get to a point where we understand, are we making improvements in the right direction or not? And if not, we throw it away very quickly. Or if not, we might say, you know, let's run two more experiments. And so it's really about collecting that data. It's about making sure that we deliver the right software. So, so that's kind of the world that I'm working in. But where is it going? Are we going to end up in a world where we have no testers? or everybody's a tester. You guys are lucky, because I have a crystal ball. I can see the future, and so I'm going to help you out. I'm going to tell you exactly where it's going. So... <laughs> so... This automation that we're doing now is amazing. If we look back, like I said, five, ten years ago, it was a very, very different landscape. And then something very evil happened, which was testers started to learn how to write code. And they started becoming very technical. And they started dreaming up all of these crazy ways of testing systems that we couldn't have imagined years ago. You know, as we started getting very, very technical testers, we started having testers that said, what would happen if I start shutting down things in production? Wonder what would happen. And so they wrote software to do that, to make sure that the site was resilient. Or we had testers that said, you know, getting, testing all of those boundary conditions, all those edge cases, that's really at time consuming, you know? And, and, and we, we, don't, we can't always think of everyone. And by the way, we probably shouldn't. But what if I could write software that overnight, that can on the fly dynamically generate millions of edge cases and just hammer this? And I know some of them are going to be ridiculous, but pull the data together 
and let me look at it in the mornings and things. So in other words, what's happened is, is as testers became more and more technical, we started having crazier and crazier ideas that we could apply to software. If you look at a lot of what's happening out there right now, it was things that were not even dreamed of to, uh, that long ago. So we have world where even things like test data management, which is always a problem, there are now actually really good solutions for this that work in a high-speed uh, dev uh, pipeline world, where even with like very complex back-end so, uh, systems. So why? Because testers became technical. I think that this is going to continue. In fact, um, I'm doing a lot of experiments with some other folks where we're playing around with insane concurrency in our tests, where we're literally running tens of thousands of tests in just a few minutes' time. And uh, it used to be in our pipeline that we would se segment out the unit test from everything else, because the unit test would run pretty fast, right? They would run in five minutes or so. And the more intense UI type tests or whatever it might be would be a separate stage because it would take an hour or two or so, uh, to run all of these. But we're at a point now where, because of some of the work that we're doing, I could run thousands of these in 10 minutes. And there's no need now to segment these things out. So the other thing that's going to happen is we're going to get much, much, much smarter pipelines. Now, let me talk just a little bit about what I mean by pipelines. So, um, you've heard of continuous integration, right? Where you check in your code and it checks it out and it does a build and it runs some tests and things like that. So what we're doing, what's starting to happen out there right now is we're starting to take things that we thought we couldn't bring into the pipeline and we're bringing it into the pipeline. So for years and years, we've been able to, you know, do all, all of our automation there. And we've been able to, you know, uh, run things across multiple browsers and mobile devices. Uh, I think it was like five or six years ago or so where I decided, you know, what would happen if we started bringing our capacity type testing into our pipeline? And so I went to the specialists who were doing the, all of the load and, and uh, scalability tests. I said, hey, I want to run these uh, continuously. And after I got over all of the jaws hitting the floor and all the thump, 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 because they're like, there's no way that can happen, we found a way to do it. So the same with security. And then, all of a sudden, like I was talking earlier, we said, what would happen if we treat changes to our code the same way that we treat changes to our environments and we run everything down the pipeline? So our pipelines of the future are actually not only going to do that, but and, and actually this isn't in the future, this is now, where they're also building out our environments on the fly. So we're moving to worlds where you've heard of serverless architectures. So the ideas that we're working with right now are ideas where we don't change environments. So remember the caching setting that I was talking about? We don't change it. What we do is we build a new one. So it is becoming easier and easier because of these things called DevOps to be in a world where, um, where it's easier to build a new machine than it is to change an existing one. So, but where does this, I still haven't answered the question, everybody is a tester or nobody's a tester? Well, I think that when I'm working with teams, um, a lot of what I do is I write code with people. That's a large part of my job. And so when I'm helping a team learn how to get their code to a quality where we can check code in and it goes straight to production, and remember I said that it's, it's largely about changing how we think about quality. So what I tend to do is I tend to sit down with developers and share a keyboard and show them how to do test-driven development. I sit down with testers and share a keyboard and show them how to do automation and how to build out quality automation. I sat down with teams and we talk about where should we test this? How do we test that? And learning around you know, 
how to build out the right tests, making sure that, you know, uh, tests that should be unit tests are, by the way, from my experience, about 75 or more percent of what we tend to drive through the UI, those all should be unit tests. Something interesting happens over time, though, is that as we're doing this, the testers are curious about what the developers are doing, and the developers are curious about what the testers are doing, and so they tend to pair with each other a bit. You know, I'm curious about that automation. you mind if I ch pair with you for on that? And so on. I think that I have achieved success with that team whenever they start to have conversations like, you know this distinction that we have of developer and tester? That distinction sort of doesn't make sense anymore because so much of what we're doing, we're sharing it. Everybody's doing it. If, uh, if the developers are having difficulty, a tester goes and pairs with them. If a tester is having difficulty, the developer goes and pairs with them or if they're, if they're curious. And so after a while, everybody is focused on quality. Everybody is focused on testing. And that distinction that exists there in the past doesn't make sense anymore. Now, it's kind of frightening for testers because you say, what do you mean? Are you trying to say that there's not going to be testers in the future? Actually, I'm not saying that at all. If you would come to spend some time with the teams that I'm working with, what you'll see is that everybody's testing. Quality is paramount. In fact, I think this is a good thing for testers. And this is going to be a little scary, but so often in our industry, testers are looked at as not at the same level as developers. Developer salaries are often a little bit higher than testers. Uh, if there are different quality of machines, the developers usually get the better machines. Have you experienced that? I heard, yep. So in this new world, though, what we started to realize is that we expect the same level of technical excellence out of our testers as we do from our developers. And so I think that what's starting to happen is we're entering a world where those lines are getting very, very blurred. If you had come to visit the teams that I'm working with right now, and if you spent an hour or two with the team, you would be really hard pressed to know who has the title of developer and who has the title of tester. And it's because the collaboration is so high that they're working with each other so much and everybody is so focused on quality that you're going to walk there and you're going to say, where's the developers? Everybody's testing. I think this world is coming a lot faster than we think it is as well. So. When I started off, I asked how many are doing continuous delivery, and we saw about half the people here, maybe even a little more than half, raise their hands. You cannot achieve continuous delivery. You cannot deploy to production many times a day unless of everybody on the team is focused on quality. You cannot deliver to production multiple times a day unless if you put these pipelines in place, and unless if you stop at these things that I've talked about, we have to do this in order to have the safety, in order to drive the risk out of delivering to production multiple times a day. So I think the future is very coming to us very, very fast. Half of you who raised your hands, you're going to continuous delivery. In the next two or three years, as you're continuing to do this, and as you're going down this path, you're going to start to see that distinction of developer and tester really start to, to become, um, maybe disappear, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So is it something we should be afraid of? I don't think so. I think that. Not only is this future fast and furious and crazy, but it's also amazing. There's a lot of satisfaction that comes out of 
producing very, very high quality software. There's a lot of satisfaction that comes out of uninstalling that defect tracking tool or deleting that, that spreadsheet that where we have all those defects. There's something amazing about working with a product owner that has an idea today, we build it, and in a few hours, our customers get to see it, and they get to touch it and feel it. This is an amazing world, and so I feel very excited about the future. And um, testers, developers, everybody's a tester in the future. And thank you very much.